Welcome to Home Ties, a podcast about staying connected to home, no matter where you are. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. By the time I was 21 years old, I had totaled three motor vehicles. I guess that's why I am a little sensitive when people insinuate I'm a poor driver. When I arrived in Malawi in 2017, I found out that my American driver's license was not valid, that I needed to get a Malawian driver's license, and that I had to take a test. Didn't they know about my spotless driving record? Hadn't had a ticket for years? Didn't they know about my low insurance premiums? Hadn't I learned how to drive on the left-hand side of the road to negotiate roundabouts and uncontrolled intersections to avoid hitting pedestrians and bicyclists who weaved in and out of traffic without any regard to traffic laws? If there were any laws, didn't seem like anybody was even obeying them. What's the point of taking a test? Now, those were some of the thoughts that were going through my mind at the time, I'm ashamed to admit. I guess it serves me right that on my first attempt to pass the written exam, I only got half the answers right. Yeah, it turns out that there are a lot of differences between the signs in the United States and in Malawi, even if most of those signs only exist on paper. We all have blind spots to our own faults. We have blind spots to our our own culture's faults as well. When you leave your home country, you begin to see yourself and your culture through the eyes of others. And it's not always flattering. That's a part of culture shock that I want to talk about today, the sin of pride. Culture shock manifests itself in many different ways. One of the ways that is common in many places amongst many people is the ugly American syndrome. It's the same thing as walking around with a chip on your shoulder. You put yourself in a different category from others, and you say, for example, the people here, I can't believe that they live like that. We would never do things that way in our country. Why can't they think the way that we do? Of course, you fail to see how others might ask you the same questions. Why are you acting like such a fool? Why can't you do it? the way everybody else does. You know, as an expat, you face an identity crisis, right? Aren't I an intelligent adult? Aren't I capable of taking care of myself? You know, you can achieve some level of self-confidence if you just stay with your own kind, people who look like you and think like you. If you rely on the familiar tools, and technology that you used in your home country, although Google Maps doesn't tell you when a flood washes out the bridge. You can fool yourself into thinking, yeah, I've got this figured out by just trying to live your life as much in the new country as you did in the country you left. But that only exacerbates the problem of us versus them. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of 2 Corinthians, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. God has all kinds of ways to show us our blind spots, and certainly he's been showing them to me through this experience. I was an active pastor in the ministry, serving in a thriving congregation in a large metropolitan city. I was the guy on the stage every Sunday, giving the message. I was the one teaching the children, counseling the troubled couples, visiting the sick. I was the one in the driver's seat of that ministry. And God took me from there to a place where I have a supporting role behind the scenes, standing in the shadows, supporting my African brothers in the ministry. And I really need to thank God for that. I need to thank God for not letting me stay where I was because I probably would have become a bully in the pulpit. And when I think of those words where the apostle writes, it's not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends, it makes me remember how foolish it is to try and say that and think that your culture is superior to someone else's. Because finally, no human being comes even close to doing what God expects. 
God says be perfect in your thoughts and your words, your actions. I certainly don't do that. It's not really a, a question of my culture versus someone else's. It's really a question of God versus all the rest of humanity. And yet God's son bridged that gap. If anybody should have had a chip on his shoulder, it should have been Jesus. He was the almighty God who created the entire universe. He was the commander in chief of all angel armies. He was everywhere at once, filling the whole universe. And yet Jesus became one of us. Jesus limited himself to a weak human body. He put himself under the limitations that we all face. He endured sickness and hunger and thirst and pain, and he was tired. He walked from one place to another instead of just teleporting himself. And then Jesus endured the greatest humiliation of all, death on the cross. And during all that time, not once did Jesus complain. Not once did Jesus say, how come you people don't do it the way that I'm doing it? It's because Jesus didn't have a chip on his shoulder. He was perfect in his obedience and perfect in humility. And so it's because of Jesus that I have any hope. It's because of Jesus that I know God is proud of me. I can't do it myself. I can't demonstrate my worthiness through my skills and what I do. But through faith in Christ, I already am perfect. I already am competent. I already have achieved everything that is needed to be with him in heaven. So I really ought to be thankful. Whenever I say or do something which is inappropriate or culturally insensitive, and my brothers point out my failure. I ought to be thankful for that opportunity to learn and improve. And because Jesus was perfect in my place, after I endure the final humiliation of death, I will hear God say to me, well done, faithful servant. Now, there are many conveniences in the United States that make life very comfortable. And of course, you take those conveniences for granted until you leave. And then you are confronted with the inconveniences of living in a developing country. And culture shock can turn little molehills into giant mountains and shake you to the core and cause you to ask, what have I done? In April 2011, an F5 tornado cut through the states of Mississippi and Alabama and killed over 70 people. It was a tragedy that affected my community. The tornado tracked two miles north of my house and in so doing knocked out the main power transmission lines from the nuclear power plant. We went without power for six days. It was the first time I had ever written a sermon by hand, and I preached in the dark. We had no refrigerator, no stove, just a Weber grill, and of course we had to eat our frozen steaks before they got ruined. And many people left town during that week in order to stay with relatives who had power. We stayed put. For us, it was a kooky diversion from suburban life. Well, six years later, I find myself in a developing country whose power company slogan is towards power all day, every day. In other words, the system can't cope with the demands for power during the dry season. There's less water that's flowing through the hydroelectric dams, which means less kilowatts produced, which in turn means load shedding. That's basically where people take turns going without power in order to not over overload the system. People share the pain. Now, our house had a generator. It was barely strong enough to power the lights and some outlets. But there's no way you could use the the cook stove or, or have a hot shower or, 
or any shower for that matter, because the city also has water rationing. And even though we have a big green reserve tank that fills with water when it's running, you've got to have power to run the pump. And of course, the, the pump is not connected to the generator. Yeah, power cuts are the bane of the dry season. The plague of the rainy season are ants. You wake up in the middle of the night and find them swarming all over your body. One morning I woke up and they were pouring out of the sockets in our bedroom. It was like we were in that old show, The Amityville Horror, and marching in formation across the wall into your wardrobe, covering your clothes. And of course, you would naturally say, this would never happen in America. Oh, really? They don't have ants in America? Well, I did step in a fire ant nest in North Alabama once. I'll never do that again. There are more dirt roads than paved ones here in Malawi. And not just in the villages, there are dirt roads within the city limits as well. Right here in my own neighborhood, there are no suburban sidewalks and, and gutters and, and rainstorm sewers. Instead, there are deeply cut canals and ditches along the side of the road. I first arrived in Malawi during the dry season. And when I say dry season, it means dry. It hadn't, doesn't rain for up to six months. Yeah, but during the dry season, dirt roads make a lot of sense. That clay gets packed like cement. And I couldn't figure out what the ditches were for until the rains came. And the water mostly goes where it's supposed to. But when it's standing on the road, that clay turns to quicksand. That's why the dirt roads have a high bevel in the middle of the road to shed water on either side. And when you're driving in that in those conditions, you want to stay right on top of that hill. Because if you start sliding down towards the ditch on one side or the other, and you're done for. Four-wheel drive notwithstanding. And I found that out. My two outside wheels were stuck in the track along the road. You can't get out, going forwards or backwards. But then 12 guys came out of nowhere and lifted up the front end of my truck and got me out of the ditch. Psalm 66 says, You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. The psalmist is talking about the Jews' experiences in slavery for 400 years. During those years, they had to deal with more than just some inconveniences. Their faith in God's promises were put to the test. They wondered if God was really looking out for them. Then came liberation and a new set of hardships. You know, life in the desert was no fun. No running water there <laughs> or power. Survival meant trusting God to provide them with food and water and also to give them direction where they were going. As those Jews crisscrossed the Sinai Peninsula and left their people buried in the dirt, did they feel like prisoners? Were they going through culture shock? There was no way for them to return to Egypt and no rest going forward for the foreseeable future. The psalmist, however, notes that God was the one who put them in their position it wasn't their choice. It wasn't the fault of Moses or the devil. And so I think about how God has brought me to this place, not to torment me, but to burn away the chaff in my heart and to focus my attention on the one thing that's needed. It truly is a privilege to be in this place, to see the not only the suffering of people, but even more so the comfort that they receive.
from the smallest acts of kindness. Lord, I pray you forgive my self-centered attitude, my feeling sorry for myself, my complaining about the hardships that I endure, which are really not hardships at all by comparison to what other people endure. God has given me a very comfortable life here. But even more importantly, I have peace through Christ with him. No matter what happens here, no matter how much or how little I'm able to accomplish in any given day, God has secured my place in heaven. And he is the one leading me through this dry desert my whole life. I don't want it to be any other way. Next time on Home Ties. American culture is in love with celebrity. The individual who stands out in the crowd. It's not so fun, however, when you're a 900-pound gorilla in a tuxedo at a wedding. You can't just hide behind the floral arrangement on the table and hope no one notices. It's just another reminder that this place is not your home. We'll see you next time.